Hi everyone and welcome to the Serial Geek TV YouTube channel. My name is James Etock and today we're going to take a look at an episode of the Transformers that much of the fan base celebrates. Not because it tells a fascinating story full of drama and wonderment, but because the visuals are, well, rather phenomenal. When Call of the Primitives originally aired it was a very welcome change. Much of season 3 of the Transformers had been farmed out to Acom, a Korean animation studio not known for their quality across the second season. Season 3 was no exception. In fact, it was worse. Way, way worse. Acom dominated many of the episodes with their lacklustre animation, poor direction and scenes that were riddled with mistakes. Personally, I find it hard to watch season 3 of the Transformers because the visuals are often so unbelievably jarring. So how did this beautifully animated episode of the Transformers end up in the not-so-beautiful Acom ridden third season? For the longest time, the studio that worked on the episode was also a mystery. From the striking visuals throughout the episode, we know, without a shadow of a doubt, Acom had nothing to do with it. And, as much as I adore Toei Doga's work on seasons 1 and 2 of the Transformers, this does not feel like one of their shows either, with the style and direction being very different. Often, and it is understandable why, fans will shout Tokyo Movie Shinsha when someone tries to identify the studio behind episodes of their favourite cartoon. Thus is the reputation of TMS. However, coupled with the fact that Tokyo Movie Shinsha rarely worked with Marvel Productions during this time, the answer is not always Tokyo Movie Shinsha. A large part of why this episode's look is so highly regarded amongst the fans is due to the far more dynamic and detailed way in which the characters are drawn. Many, including myself for a time, believed that the look of the Transformers in this particular episode were inspired by Studio Ox's exceptional work on numerous Japanese Transformers publications and promotional material. Call of the Primitives, much like Studio Ox's work, has the robots in disguise looking a lot less box-like. The characters themselves are illustrated in a far more dynamic way than their model sheets. The oversized gigantic characters that appear in this episode are not only animated, but illustrated with a ridiculous attention to detail. I mean, just look at this comparison. Finally, in 2020, after decades of speculation, E.G. Shugunuma conversed with Transformers Wiki on Twitter, revealing that he had served as the animation director for Call of the Primitives. Not only that, but he also revealed that Marvel Productions had assigned the episode to Toei Doga, who then subcontracted the work to Studio Look. Studio Look then employed students from the International Animation Institute, and although Studio Ox were not involved, Shin Matsuo, a member of Studio Ox, animated certain shots and thus brought his stylistic choices to the episode. Call of the Primitives ultimately stands as a tantalising hint of what the series may have looked like with a large enough budget and even more detailed character designs. And in a way, this is the only real downside of the episode. I now present to you a look at some of the most striking visuals and animated sequences from this episode. The episode starts off like any other, but within seconds of seeing this close-up of Springer flanked by Rodimus Prime, we notice that something is very different with the visuals. Aside from the obvious abundance of detail on the characters, the way in which the Transformers themselves are illustrated is a lot less box-like than what Acom had been producing throughout the third season. In fairness, Toei Doga's work on the Transformers also had the characters box-like, but in a style that was a great deal more aesthetically pleasing than Acom's work. Incidentally, Toei's work on Transformers the movie featured character models that were far less box-like than what we had seen in the series up until that point. These designs would not translate well in the hands of Acom, especially as they'd end up interchangeably using Marvel Productions movie models. Another notable stylistic choice that the episode brings to the world of the Transformers is the heavy, yet appropriate, use of black shadows, as can be seen in this image of Rodimus Prime. This technique was rarely ever employed in the Transformers, or any cartoon of the 80s for that matter, with two-tone shading often used to create depth or imply a strong off-screen light source. The black shadows in this episode are somewhat unnecessary but add to the beauty and style that make Call of the Primitives so highly regarded. One of the things this episode excels at is the use of unique camera angles to make the Transformers look imposing. The low angle of this illustration, the use of blacks to create depth and the character's pose with his head cocked to one side, is unlike anything Akon would have attempted. Ultra Magnus has never looked more dynamic. 
Believe it or not, this image showcases Japanese character design at its finest. Ultra Magnus's antennae were traditionally rendered as two simple vertical poles. However, in this episode, the animators choose to make the antennae very thin and have them point outwards, an energetic style which adheres to numerous classic Japanese robot designs. This image of Galvatron shows just how striking the illustrations of the characters are in this episode. Instead of merely standing there looking like a robot, Galvatron is illustrated in a more natural pose with human-like proportions. Most notably, this can be seen in the way in which his thighs are drawn and the fact that his upper body is bigger than his waist. This group image of Decepticon characters shows the more majestic way in which the heroes and villains are illustrated, specifically with regards to Galvatron and Cyclonus. You can see that their chests are more pronounced, with their heads slightly back, making the characters themselves look a great deal more imposing than they normally would. In this scene in which Ultra Magnus fights Cyclonus, we see a unique take and yet another example of how this episode's action differs from every other episode. Ultra Magnus readies himself for battle as Cyclonus swoops into shot by adopting a much lower stance. As Ultra Magnus swats Cyclonus, we see specific movement lines coloured to match Ultra Magnus's blue forearms that negate the use of frames illustrating the blow being struck. The yellow flash indicating the strike is something that appears in this episode on numerous occasions, showing action-based impact. Ultra Magnus's pose shows that his proportions are a lot more human-like than robot. By far one of my most favourite shots in the entire episode is probably one of the shots featuring the least animation. When the Terracons begin to form the giant Abominus, we see the chest of the giant awaiting the completion of the merge. We then see the lines of movement illustrated on Ripper Snapper as he attaches himself to Abominus, becoming the giant's arm. The lines of movement are only there for one frame but add to the dynamism of the sequence. Now normally when Abominus's head would appear, it would simply just rise up like every other Gisalt Transformer. However, in this instance we are treated to a spectacular attention to detail, and this is largely in part due to the beautiful character design unique to this episode. Abominus's head pops up and we immediately notice that his antennae are far more pronounced than any other episode, but in one of the most fantastic attentions to detail, we see the antennae flick out to their preferred position, indicated wonderfully with white movement lines, as if the antennae have caught the light somehow. As I mentioned before with regards to Ultra Magnus, the antennae on certain Transformers are illustrated in a much more striking way in this episode than in the entirety of the series. This enables the animators in this particular scene with Abominus to make this small character design trait literally shine in a small but incredibly dynamic touch. Sadly, if you look at any other appearance made by Abominus in the series, he just looks somewhat bland when compared to the pronounced, detailed and depth-ridden design of the character here. Another unique touch throughout the episode is the way in which the characters fire their weapons. Instead of merely holding the gun up with laser fire spewing forth from it, the animators have the character's arm, in this case Rodimus Prime, recoil from the force of the blast. Of course, this enables more stylistic choices, and we see an arcing motion of leftover laser fire, which not only creates a sense of movement, but just looks visually impressive. Once again, the angle of the sequence in which the gun is favoured is an example of just how much care was clearly put into this particular episode in each and every shot. One of the biggest cast members of the Transformers was Trypticon. He was an oversized gigantic robot that transformed from a giant base of operations for the Decepticons into a menacing dinosaur-like robot. His appearances in the series up until this point have been less than satisfactory, and due to Acom's style of animation, he was often drawn very simple, with the exception of the Season 3 episode The Ultimate Weapon, another Toei Doga animated show. The one problem Acom seemed to have with the character was that his movements often belay a robot of his massive height and weight, at times appearing ridiculously light on his feet. Not only does Call of the Primitives give Trypticon a ridiculous amount of detail, but he is also animated in a way befitting of his great height and weight. In this shot in which the Decepticons depart, we not only see a good use of low angle, but we are also treated to some typically over the top yet beautiful Japanese animation. In order to take to the skies, most of the Transformers would simply rise into the air with little fanfare. In this sequence, Galvatron crouches with his arms outstretched while smoke builds up behind him during these frames. He then leaps upwards, which we only catch for a frame or two, accompanied by speed lines, followed by wonderfully rendered cells depicting his afterburners. Not to be outdone, both Cyclonus and Soundwave are depicted with a similar departure. 
One of the sequences featuring the fullest and most heavily detailed animation is this scene in which Grimlock goes after Tornadron. With Grimlock charging in the distance, Tornadron, who is surrounded by an ever-changing and always animated energy, crouches slightly. Just as Grimlock bears down on him, Tornadron vanishes. His disappearance is of course accompanied by a beautifully animated light show. The moment we see Grimlock on screen, the only remnants of Tornadron are the remaining pieces of dissipating light. Grimlock's foot strikes the edge of the cliff and the ground immediately gives way. Much like Trypticon, the artist managed to animate Grimlock with weight. In other words, when he falls, his body moves in a way that a large robotic dinosaur would. We see gravity take over and pull him down as his head lashes back through the weight of the unexpected fall. It should be noted at this point that the cliff itself is cell based and not just a painted background, so it too requires animating in every single frame. In a fantastic attention to character design and something never seen on the show up until this point, we see the underside of Grimlock's foot actually depicts his fist. For those confused, in his robot mode, Grimlock's legs become his arms and his hands emerge from the bottom of them. To see that the artists have chosen to depict his fists is an incredibly nice touch. The frames hold briefly on Grimlock's slide, then increase with great fluidity as he slides down the cliff, accompanied by heavily rendered rocks and debris. One of the things Call of the Primitives includes in numerous scenes is comedy animation, which is surprising for an episode consisting of dynamic poses and striking sequences. Here we see a sequence in which Razorclaw accidentally walks into the back of Grimlock. Instead of the character simply colliding, the animators have one frame showing the moment of impact, accompanied by some fantastic black lines. These lines are unnecessary, but due to them only being on screen for a frame, they help add to the impact. Razorclaw is then animated, rising into the air for a few frames as Grimlock topples forward. These frames are animated in such a way that it almost feels like a moment held in time. Suddenly, the next frame shows Razorclaw landing on Grimlock's back, creating a large plume of dust. The appearance of Unicron in this episode is a surprising one. Although a static shot, the laser beams are beautifully animated, bursting forth from his eyes. It has to be said that the detail in which Unicron is rendered, featuring a plethora of lines to indicate all the panels that comprise his outer shell, as well as the imposing style in which he is depicted, is actually on par with what we see in Transformers the movie. Once more showcasing the beauty of using a low angle to dramatic effect, we see the last moments of Unicron. The level of detail is phenomenal, and in this particular shot, Unicron is actually animated. His body, clearly racked with pain, forces him to turn to one side before holding the pose. We then see green rays of light emerge from his body as the Matrix begins to destroy him from within. One frame prior to the explosion shows Unicron illuminated white against black, with the initial green light of the explosion occurring. The next sequence of frames are so wonderfully executed as we see Unicron explode. However, unlike the movie, this explosion is more dynamic. We firstly see the upper portions of his chest being pushed outwards by the force of the explosion. Sensibly, these frames are animated in such a way that we can see the explosion is almost struggling to push itself outwards, again giving weight and believability to the robot that is the size of a planet. As his upper chest cavity explodes, we see other sections begin to push forth, culminating in an amazing sequence. Another piece of comedy animation seen in this episode once again features Grimlock. As a lifeless Trypticon begins to topple over, the Transformers all flee for their lives. In a beautifully illustrated sequence, we see Snarl in the foreground race past the camera as Grimlock runs behind him, with Trypticon continuing to topple in the background. The use of blacks in this shot, most notably on Snarl, are perfect. The fact that the blacks are used on the underside of his body, including his feet, adds great depth to the character, and the black on his tail creates a reflective effect. Impressively, through every frame of this shot, Trypticon is animated, falling closer and closer to the ground. The star of this shot, however, is Grimlock. It must be incredibly difficult to depict and animate a running dinosaur. Fortunately, the animators play the shot for humour and we are treated to one of the funniest sequences involving Grimlock in the entire series. Grimlock runs with all the grace of a giant robotic dinosaur, though he often seems incredibly light on his toes. A wonderfully animated shot shows Headstrong turn to face his opponent. 
we see the character run into shot accompanied by some fantastically rendered speed lines. Instead of just having the character stop and turn, we see a striking flash indicating his dramatic stop. Headstrong then slides for a few frames creating a plume of dust before quickly asserting a new pose. The timing of animation used in this shot is breathtaking and helps to show the character's determination which matches his aggressive dialogue. Much like Headstrong, Razorclaw is animated in a similar fashion. He leaps into shot accompanied by speed lines. He then grinds to a halt accompanied by both a striking flash and large plumes of dust as he skids for a few frames. He then animates into a striking dramatic pose as he commands his fellow Predacons into action. One of the few character panning shots in this episode has to be seen to be believed. The Predacons merge to form Predaking and we see the oversized gigantic Transformer illustrated in a wonderfully dramatic pose from a low angle. As with numerous other character designs in this episode, Predaking thankfully does not adhere to his character model and numerous features are exaggerated, creating a dynamic looking robot. This sequence is regarded by many as the money shot in the episode and was animated by Shin Matsuo. Instead of simply standing there and firing his weaponry, in true Japanese anime robot tradition, Predaking strikes poses that are utterly unnecessary but that help convey a sense of expression and action through a few simple frames. When the Dinobots vow to avenge Grimlock, they each leap out to attack Tornigron. Slag's attack is striking in that the large rock pile he stands behind explodes with great fury and in great detail too. We then see him fire bolt after bolt of laser fire from his horns. The way in which the bolts are animated is a visual treat, utilising every anime technique to convey laser fire. There are numerous other moments throughout Call of the Primitives that showcase wonderful moments of animation. The aforementioned scenes that I have featured are the ones that I believe stand out more than most. It's a shame that we never saw this level of detail more frequently in Season 3 of the Transformers. When you see a series like Machine Robo, on which Ishii Shugunama was the animation director, you see that it is possible to make a series with consistently high quality and dynamic animation. However, for we the fans of the Transformers, Call of the Primitives is one of the best oddities in the series. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, share and subscribe and I will catch you on the next one.